Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the in stove uh, factory. Um, what you see in this factory is the is the model that we export. It's it's the tool set and the mo the methods and procedures that we use to get these stoves built uh, anywhere in the world. Um, I got an email from Nigeria yesterday. My guys are, will have 120 stoves built by the time they leave. They're producing uh, 10 stoves a day with 11 new trainees. Some of them have only been on the job for a week and a half. So what, what we've successfully done is gone from a model and a theory to reality with our new, with our new shop in Nigeria. And it's a brand new building. In fact, uh, their factory looks better than ours, uh, just because it's a brand new building with one dedicated purpose. This old shop has been here for decades and used for a bunch of different things. So, um, I think I began to talk yesterday about about this this marriage of 21st century material science and 19th century technologies, 19th century assembly. So here's a basic example of the kinds of laser cut inputs we have. So this is the, uh, the, the origami piece that becomes the can for a 100 liter combustion chamber. Okay? Uh, you can see it's a pretty complicated drawing. Um, but what this includes are there are some layout holes here for, uh, for the final assembly of the combustion chamber. There are marking guides for all the bins that happen. So we take a piece like this and use these simple hand brakes. This one, that one, these again, these are these are tools uh, our our grandfathers, some of your great grandfathers would recognize in 1910 from uh, metalworking shops. They're very basic. They're very solid tools. They'll last a many 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 years with hard use. Um, so we take a piece like this and fold it up into this box. So this is the this is the basic box for the combustion chamber for a 100 liter stove. Okay. What we're doing now is uh, changing the, this metal from 310 stainless to 601 stainless. Um, in our 100 liter stove, it's, it's a one inch bigger combustion chamber, but the firepower is hugely increased. And we're finding with our pasteurizer, we're running it for 10 hour stretches. Um, we're generating more heat than the 310 can tolerate. So we're going to the 601, which rates another 100 degrees and should be fine for for even the heavy use of running a pasteurizer. So to finish this combustion chamber, we take another piece of, of 310 and roll a cylinder, and that's the riser tube of the, of the uh, rocket. Um, this tool here is called a roll forming machine. It's made to roll flanges on cylinders. Okay? So we take a flat piece of metal and, and roll it into a cylinder on this tool behind Stella to make the cylinder. We weld that with a simple spot welder. You can see behind me here. Um, so we roll a cylinder and then we roll flanges on the cylinder in this, basically stretching the metal. So where's that, have you got a, uh, yeah, here's. So this is a skirt, okay? We start with a blank down here, a blank piece of laser cut metal, okay? Um, this is the skirt side, so it come, it's a flat, it's a flat piece of metal. We uh, roll it, weld the joint like that. You can see the weld marks. And then on this, on this roll forming machine, roll this flange on the bottom. Okay. The bottom of the skirt comes as a, just a, a round uh, piece of metal. Again, laser cut. Um, yeah, there's the blank. So on this jig behind us, so this is one of our custom jigs. It's a very simple tool. This flange is where the combustion chamber meets the skirt. Okay? That's done with a hammer. And then we roll form this flange. And then both pieces get put together on that jig. We weight it down. You can see we're using a very clever uh, free weights for the top weight. We haven't found a superior system yet, so we export free weights with our, with our factory in a box. And then these two pieces get hammered together. So this, this flange just gets hammered onto that flange. And we make a seam that is really durable. I think this is what the way they made tin cans in the 18th century. This is, this is really old technology. But guess what? It works. And guess what? We, we're looking now to, 
to upgrade the way we do things here because we really can't afford to pay our guys to swing hammers to do this, this kind of work. So we're going to upgrade here for production to, to drive prices down. But in the export model, these are great jobs. This is a, they're loud and they're, and they're tedious, um, but they're great jobs in $1, $2 a day economies. And people will stand in line to get work like this to make these stoves. So the custom jigs, there are, there are a handful of tools around. Small tools like this, um, tools of our design, of Damon's design, of our manufacturer, tools to, uh, to form the various pieces. So this is the finishing jig for finishing the chimney pieces. We started out, we thought we would make these stoves out of recycled oil drums. And so we started buying up recycled drums. Um, we found that they were more expensive to recondition and use than buying new. And at the end of the day, we had funky looking stoves made out of old oil drums with a lot of dents and um, a lot of them came with toxic stuff inside we didn't know, we couldn't control. And we found out interestingly that there are about 50 different shapes of 55 gallon drums being made in the US. So if you're gonna mass produce, you gotta standardize your inputs. So we found it's cheaper to have these, these drums manufactured. There's a drum company in Portland who makes drums for the UN, and now they make our housings for us. So this, this jig is, uh, again, I, mean, I think an example of something you might find uh, 150 years ago in a, in a machine shop. Um, it's, this is a collaborative design. Uh, we started with Damon's basic work. The guys in the shop have been making constant improvements to make these work better. The drum gets inverted over this. All the drilling, all of the layout for the combustion chamber, the chimney parts, the bolt system that holds the whole thing together all gets done on this jig. So, there, so this is a 100 liter layout jig over here. It's a 60 liter layout jig, very similar. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the 100 liter stove at the entrance there, there's handles on the stove now. Um, that's been a common uh, request from the field, please put handles on your stove. So now, starting now, every end stove has a set of handles on it. Um, we started out with uh, four bolts holding the whole rig together. We've gone to six bolts on the 60 liter stove. Add durability, add, add longevity. Um, our estimation now is going up. When we started, we said, well, we thought these stoves would last somewhere in the range of three to five years in hard hard use conditions. We're, we're confident that that, that, that window is, is accurate. And because we're mass producing, because all these parts are interchangeable, if we can get production closer to the end users, they can do maintenance and warranty work. They can have crews going out. We're imagining a guy on a, on a motorcycle with a sidecar or a little trailer with a handful of parts going out and changing out combustion chambers, changing out skirts when they burn out, this gets us up into the range of a 10-year stove. And that, a few years ago when there were carbon markets, that was, that was solid gold. There's still voluntary carbon markets, and we think we, think we, have, a, we have a product that, can, that, can, that makes great good sense in, in voluntary or mandatory carbon markets. Um, one 60 liter stove will offset 30 tons of CO2 a year. A 100 liter stove somewhere in the range of 40 to 50 tons. So one of these stoves at under $1,000 can offset the, the average extravagant uh, carbon footprint of an American family. Um, we're, th we're seeing lots of opportunities here for fundraising for people to, to buy into supporting these stoves, to getting these stoves to poor people and scrubbing up their own karma for, for our, wasteful, uh, our wasteful lifestyles. So, um, what else can I say? Uh, there's an interesting uh, um, kind of gold rush going on now for making stoves and making money, selling stoves. Um, Damon and I started this believing that this was not a profit opportunity that we are humanitarians and our mission is to serve. That said, we have to create sustainable businesses. We have to do that at InStove. 
we think people there may maybe there are profit opportunities um, the global alliance's whole whole thrust is market there are market solutions okay where we are in the world of NGOs there are no markets there are no functioning markets so I don't quite get it yet. What, what, how this is mar market solutions? Where are the, where is that going to come from? Um, we think it has to be this, this public-private partnership kind of deal where we engage philanthropy, governments, um, international aid agencies, um, other NGOs, and come up with delivery systems to serve people who need these stoves. I think we've got to subsidize stoves across the board, from big stoves to small stoves. I think the World Bank and the other big, the big bucks outfits have got to come to that realization. If we're going to deliver a billion stoves, we've got to, we've got to, the goal of 100, 100 million stoves is just, that's replacement rate. That, that's, that's not, that's just beginning, so, yeah, so. I've been in a dozen, in a dozen refugee camps and um, it's heart-wrenching and, and we can be of service there to people who have very few people in service of them. Did I say, how did I, did that make sense? Yeah, okay. It's mostly women and kids. Um, the institutional cooking is, is a different animal from household cooking, but the pressure on firewood is real and it's, and it's extreme. I was in one camp in Darfur where women reported that they got raped every three times they went out for firewood and had no choice. If they wanted to feed their kids, they had to go out and gather firewood. Um, that's just unacceptable, you know? Um, that's our job collectively, is to solve some of these problems. And th this is about women's lives, it's about children's lives, first and foremost. And um, that's what motivates me. I hope that's what comes to motivate you all to 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 serve people who need who need help and they need the best we can give them. <laughs>